Good afternoon, everyone. Last week, I talked about all the bills that passed at the very end of the session, which is starting to head to my desk and will continue to do so over the next several weeks. So I wanted to take a few minutes today to talk about how I tackle these decisions and what I weigh as I contemplate whether to sign a bill, let it go into law without signature, or veto it. Now, as you all know very well, a lot gets made over the number of vetoes I've issued. But the reality is, I could have vetoed many more in the past, and then I probably will this year. Having said that, I want to be clear. I would rather come to agreement before a bill comes to my desk and avoid a veto altogether. But I have a responsibility to take the time to weigh the good against the bad. And if I can see the benefits to Vermonters across the state, I try to find a way to get to yes. And sometimes it takes a veto so I can finally get legislation to the table to find a compromise. Despite what some will say, I really do try hard to meet legislators in the middle because we actually share many of the same priorities from addressing climate change to making childcare and healthcare more accessible and affordable, to raising wages, to making sure our kids are getting the best education possible. Where we tend to differ is how we get there. Sometimes the legislature focuses so much on their goals, they don't consider the unintended consequences. And the reality is there are almost always some negative consequences as a result of any new policy. Now, I also believe there's often a path to reach our goals that limits those consequences. But to find that right balance, we have to take our time to get it right, to walk before we run, and importantly, make sure Vermonters can afford it. Unfortunately, due to the lack of balance in the legislature, they don't want to hear about the consequences, limitations, or barriers when it comes to their initiatives. This means some bills end up doing more harm than good. Another challenge we face is the legislature doesn't always consider the practical realities that go along with the implementation. We see a number of bills pass where there was not careful consideration of what resources it will take and what a realistic timeline looks like. This sets agencies and partners up for failure and pits policies against each other when we don't have the budget capacity to fund the many initiatives the legislature passes. Most of the time, these sweeping policies require years to implement. And yet, before the legislative ink is dry on one policy, they move on to what's next with little regard for how it impacts the last thing they passed. At the same time, they typically come with a cost whether that's through new taxes and fees or unfunded mandates that put a strain on the state budget. So in the same way our agencies and are scrambling to keep up with the legislature's ambitions, taxpayers are getting crushed by the ever-growing costs getting put on their shoulders. Vermonters barely get a chance to catch their breath and adjust their budgets to a new expense before another is tacked on. And that is one of my biggest concerns. What can Vermonters really afford? It's different in every corner of the state, which is why the governor, who represents all communities, not just a district or county, has veto power. It's the final checkpoint on behalf of the state as a whole. Now, there are many bills coming to my desk this year that contain a lot of good. And most of the time, there is a path to get us to the goal. But too often, especially in recent years, the compromises and warnings we offer are ignored. So as I've always done, I will carefully weigh the good against the bad to make a decision based on whether the benefits outweigh the negative impacts for our entire state. These decisions aren't easy, and they're not always popular here in Montpelier, but I'll take that heat and I believe I'm making the right choice for the everyday Vermonter. So with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Moore. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. 
I appreciate the opportunity to be able to provide some more detail around the types of concerns and challenges the governor just highlighted in his remarks. The past five months have been filled with vital policy discussions, important debates, and some successful collaborations, many of which involved areas of interest and concern for the Agency of Natural Resources. From the flood safety concerns addressed in S-213, to climate action in S-259, to housing and land use permitting in H-687, this was really an active session for ANR. And I am grateful for the consistent, not just interest, but passion that Vermonters and legislators alike bring to the work of environmental stewardship and share the, their growing sense of urgency to act. Increasingly, though, our challenges are not one of garnering attention for environmental concerns, but rather that people are looking for quick change and fast success, while failing to appreciate the resources required, both time and money, to make those changes. I often think of the work of the Agency of Natural Resources as a marathon, as opposed to a sprint. And the more gradual pace required to run a marathon can be frustrating to those who want to take off at a full sprint and see where it gets them. When the work we are being asked to do isn't fully funded, it's like trying to run a marathon with one shoe untied. We will absolutely make progress, but we are also not going to reach our full potential, and there's a high chance of stumbling along the way. We've seen a trend of rushing complex and significant policies. So while the intent and goal behind these policies may be good, the lack of thorough consideration and planning and robust public engagement is problematic. And while there is often a desire to characterize the debate as being for or against a certain policy, the reality is that from my vantage, it's more often about trying to make sure state government is positioned to be able to do the work well. And there is a lot of work to do. Agency staff at a are currently in the throes of implementing the significant and ongoing initiatives the legislature has put in place over the last several years. Things like leading on climate action and the implementation of the Global Warming Solutions Act, including supporting the Vermont Climate Council in drafting revisions to the Climate Action Plan, creating an environmental justice unit, and working with an advisory council to more fully integrate these important principles, not only into the work of ANR, but state government more broadly. Continuing to fulfill the 20-year commitment to clean water Vermont made under Act 64, we sometimes call Vermont's Clean Water Act, including coordinating more than $50 million a year in investments in projects to improve water quality, and leading efforts to reduce Vermonters' exposure to harmful chemicals, including PFAS in drinking water and PCBs in our schools. This is to say nothing of managing literally hundreds of millions of dollars of investment opportunities made possible by federal funds through ARPA, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and the Inflation Reduction Act, along with one-time appropriations of state funds for things to, like advancing water infrastructure projects, drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater, cleaning up contaminated brownfield properties, making dam safety improvements, and investing in state lands, including our fishing access areas, wildlife <laughs> management areas, and state parks and forests. As you might imagine, these important and ongoing efforts have absorbed every bit of agency capacity, and quite frankly, then some. So legislative mandates that come without the full resources necessary to achieve the goals strain the agency's ability to do the work timely and well. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to gain traction with lawmakers in matching the work the agency is charged with to the resources they have available. I provided testimony on several occasions this year to both the Senate and House Policy and Appropriations Committees that ANR simply cannot take on additional mandates without the full funding needed for implementation. Not partial funding, not two-thirds funding, the full funding. The state budget reflects state government's values, priorities, and commitments to Vermonters, and every dollar in the budget represents a choice, indicating what programs and services the government prioritizes. And so partially funding the work is also a reflection of values. The desire to be first in enacting policies, the first to implement PCB testing in schools, the first with a clean heat standard, the first to make big oil pay, and this often outweighs concerns about the groundwork needed for successful implementation, and a willingness to accept partial or inconsistent implementation in order to advance a wider array of priorities than the budget is truly able to support. 
This creates unfair expectations of Vermonters and the ANR public servants committed to doing this work. This year, several bills suffered from this approach. S-213, which works to increase flood safety and resilience. This bill is well-intentioned in trying to meet the moment following this summer's catastrophic floods, um, but it also includes significant policy changes. Chief among them, S-213 would place new requirements and restrictions on development on some 45,000 parcels statewide, many of which are in towns without any local zoning. S-213 envisions that this major new regulatory program will be up and running in little more than three years, during which time we need to hire staff, draft rules, create opportunities for meaningful public engagement and comment, and complete the formal rulemaking process. This work is pretty unglamorous, uh, but it also needs to be done and done well. Then there's S-259 to make big oil pay for losses and damages associated with climate change. Again, the principle here is sound, but there is a lot of work to be done to develop and document an approach that will withstand the inevitable legal challenges oil companies will bring. We recommended a stepwise approach where the agency and treasurer's office would evaluate the data and research currently available and propose a path forward for the legislature's consideration in 2025. The legislature instead opted to forge ahead, directing the agency to move forward toot suite and providing $600,000 in resources to be shared between the treasurer's office and ANR for this groundwork that is ultimately likely to be subject to millions of dollars in potential litigation costs. And finally, H-687, the Act 250 bill. Admittedly, the agency's role is not particularly prominent, but H-687 directs agency participation in a number of study committees and three rulemaking processes with no additional resources to capacitate the work, meaning it will have the unintended consequence of slowing our regulatory review work in other areas at this moment where there is both incredible housing need and infrastructure opportunities. These bills come on top of similarly significant legislative action last year that included rushing to enact the clean heat standard. The legislature was not persuaded that the schedule they established was untenable and would likely prevent the thoughtful approach needed to understand and mitigate the multiple impacts of this untested strategy. The Public Utilities Commission, in fact, reiterated this concern in a checkback report submitted to the legislature in January saying, Vermont lawmakers have directed the Vermont Public Utility Commission to engage with stakeholders and members of the public to apply our collective knowledge and creativity to the design of a first-of-its-kind regulatory framework that would apply to Vermont's heating fuel sector. The Commission intends to meet this charge in the time allowed. Even so, we are compelled to report that many participants, including key stakeholders with relevant and necessary expertise, find that the schedule required by statute is untenable and will preclude a thoughtful process. With more time, the commission would have better, would, excuse me, the commission would have time to better analyze the multiple impacts of this program and deliver a higher quality product that aligns with Vermont's environmental justice law. Increasingly, agencies are being put in a position of opposing legislation, not because the policy is misaligned with the agency mission, but because the resources and timelines provided are unreasonable. There's a lack of acknowledgement of the complexity of the work required to implement new legislation. We need to respect the details and allow adequate time and resources to manage them effectively. Going forward, I hope there will be a greater willingness to engage in thoughtful planning and comprehensive resource allocation to ensure that policies are not just well-intentioned, but also practical and effective. Thank you, Secretary Moore. And with that, we'll open up to questions. On Monday, um, you made some decisions on some bills. Do you have any other bills currently on your desk right now that you're aware of? Don't have any on my desk today, um, but there we have some in the office. There's probably five or six, um, two major bills, and uh, they are due, I think, tomorrow or the next day. So it's the, the budget being one and uh, the renewable energy standard being the other of the major bills. Is it fair to say that the renewable energy standard would also maybe fall into this, this bucket of, of bills that we're talking about that require time and effort? And I know you've signaled your, your concern about it before. What, what are your thoughts on, on renewable energy standards? Yeah, um, again, we have concerns. Uh, we have uh, Commissioner Tierney on, and she'll go into the further detail. But from my standpoint, we offered 
a solution to this early on. In fact, we had a couple of press conferences on this uh, issue uh, individually. And so we feel as though we have um, a product that we can move forward with um, that will satisfy the need at a far less cost to Vermonters. So with that, Secretary Tierney, or Commissioner Tierney, if you could uh, give us some more detail, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> I just want to underscore something that you just said and that Secretary Moore said. Uh, Secretary Moore just read the very same passage from the PUC report that I commented on as well at the press conference we had about this before uh, H-289 was voted on in the House. So it's not like we haven't been very clear with the legislature and the public that not enough time has gone into the clean heat standard uh, deliberations and that same conduct is repeating itself when it comes to the renewable energy standard. There's far too much emphasis on let's be first, let's get there first, let's be perfect, and far too little consideration of what is realistic at a pace that Vermonters can afford. And the renewable energy standard debate this year was a perfect example of that. The department came in with a proposal that had carefully considered not just how much it would take dollar-wise to get to 100% renewable energy by 2035 or thereabouts, but also uh, what else Vermonters consider. We, we reached out for 18 months to Vermonters to hear from them what they wanted, and their top priority was affordability. And it's just not credible to say it's, it's affordable to propose to them that they get to a 100% renewable energy standard at a, a cost that is embedded in 289 that is excessive when there's a perfectly viable alternative on the table that was carefully calibrated to reflect Vermonters' concerns after direct engagement with Vermonters after this legislature instructed us by law to consult with Vermonters. It's just, it's, it's, it's hard to grasp why there was such a rush then to get something through this legislative session, particularly when what did go through this legislative session was not in cons consultation with the department in any meaningful way. The alibi for that has been that the department was invited but didn't come to the table when the legislature had its working committee working on this legislation. And there's a complete failure to understand that we are an executive branch agency that is charged with doing this work as policy experts. And that is what we do 9 to 5 every day, 8.30 to 7 to 4.30 every day. We, we are busy on this work. And so to divert us from our work to attend a legislative working group that consists of stakeholders who regularly participate in this but does not reflect Vermonters is a considerable waste of resources that Vermonters pay for. Thank you, June. I guess the only other follow up, many utilities, and maybe this is for both of you, but many utilities say that they're already heading in the direction and many are already sourcing from full renewable resources. I mean, in your in your view, I mean, would this policy even, like how much of an impact would it even have? Well, again, the policy yeah. will, June? Yeah, the, yeah. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> Commissioner Tierney, go ahead. The policy will have its desired impact on the timeline that is wanted. The problem is it's going to come at a cost that is unwarranted. And to your point, our utilities are already pulling in this direction. And quite frankly, if we had left them to their own resources, they would get there in a manner that is affordable to Vermonters. But if we have to have the label of being first in the country, we are paying quite a price for that. And in my opinion, it is not worth it. The impact will be that it'll be it'll make give us a nice shiny 100% renewable number. But you have to ask yourself at what cost when you consider that the sectors that are actually at this point injecting carbon into our environment are the thermal sector and the transportation sector, how we drive and how we heat our homes. That's where the concentrated effort is needed, not necessarily in this area. It's good to do this, but it's not necessary when you're facing resource constraints, taxing authority constraints, and frankly, kitchen table budget constraints like Vermonters are facing. It's not worth the squeeze is the point. Governor, uh, Commissioner Turney, Turney just said it's hard to grasp uh, Critics of the, uh, the legislature's renewable energy standard bill say that uh, the problem with your plan is it doesn't make enough money for the renewable power industry. It yep. lies too much in out of state. Well, again, if our goal is to reduce our emissions uh, to 
uh, come to a, a carbonless society, um, then we have to pull on all strings. And, and if we can do it at an affordable rate for Vermonters, uh, we'll choose that route. Even if it doesn't use in-state renewables? Well, I, I, there's going to be greater need uh, for power. It's not, you know, we have to keep in mind, we're not static here. Um, the more we go to renewables, the more uh, we trans, uh, trans uh, uh, transfer to a, a carbonless society um, in the transportation sector, for instance, uh, go to more electric vehicles, uh, the more power we're going to need in order to charge all the vehicles. Um, that when we go to AI, uh, there's going to require a tremendous amount of power uh, at that point. So again, I'm not concerned uh, about not utilizing uh, some of the renewables from in-state. It's finding the renewable energy outside the state as well, and because we're going to need more power in general. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Tierney, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that I would refrain from dealing in absolutes here. It's not like we don't have in-state renewable generation. We have quite a bit of it already, and we can certainly use more. It's a question of when, and more importantly, where to cite it. And that's another problem with S-289. It has no safeguards in it to ensure that the new renewable energy generation is going to be cited in a way that's consistent with other Vermont values. And that's a, that's a glaring problem that the legislature left unaddressed, notwithstanding that the department brought it to their attention. Perhaps on a lighter note, the budget um, action is due tomorrow. How do you plan to handle it? Well, again, barring any technical problems with the bill, we're still pouring through it. Um, it takes a long time for Jay in particular to, to get through the bill and some of our financial uh, uh, experts as well. But barring anything technical in the bill, I plan to sign it. Okay. Specifically in the budget, there's money for additional judicial positions beyond what you initially proposed. How are you feeling about that piece? Well, again, it's not perfect, the, the bill. Uh, I would have preferred our version. Uh, I would have preferred not having uh, tax and fees raised uh, as a result, but this was a this was a, a prime example of uh, an area where we came to agreement, uh, met with the, the chair of uh, House Appropriations, the chair of the Senate Appropriations, and and we worked on a deal, something we could live with and something they could live with, and they had to give up a lot as well. So, again, it can be done, um, and and not everybody gets what they want. Uh, but um, but that's when, you know, usually a, a deal makes sense. Speaking of appropriation, Senator Jane Kitchell announced her retirement. So last time we saw you, obviously Senator Mazza did a little bit before the end of the session, but that's now five Democratic senators that have not announced their running. Some of them pretty powerful, chair of education, chair of appropriations. Do you see this more of a changing of the guard? Does it concern you at all? Because quite a few of them are kind of that fiscal moderate group that you talk about you'd like to be in the Senate, or do you kind of see this as a new window, new opportunity to kind of replace those seats when the fall comes? Oh, you know, it could be a little bit of both. Uh, Senator Kitchell will be a tremendous loss uh, to the Senate. I served with her when I was in, in the Senate. Uh, we served on transportation together. I think an awful lot of her and her common sense, her values, and and representing a rural area of the state, she understands, she gets it. Um, so she'll be a tremendous loss uh, to us. Um, Senator Campion, uh, again, just a decent human being. Uh, again, we didn't, we didn't agree on every issue. Uh, that typically isn't how it works, um, but, uh, but I trusted him and, uh, and he was just very easy and kind, uh, somebody you could deal with. So we're, uh, we're seeing the results of our, you know, demographics in our state. I mean, it's not unlike everything else we're facing, all the, the open jobs we have, uh, the workforce challenges we face, um, it's, it's showing up here in the legislature as well. And also since last time we saw you, I'm curious, what do you think of Stuart Ledbetter running for state senate? Um, well, he certainly has the background and the knowledge, and he knows his way around uh, the building. Uh, so uh, it'll be interesting to watch that race. Have you spoken with him at all before? I haven't uh, spoken to him since he announced, no. Did you speak before? I always speak to Stuart, sure. It's like I speak to you, Calvin, <laughs> Steve, maybe even you. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I just want to go back quickly just to the bills that you and Secretary Moore were talking about, 213, 687, and 259. Is it safe to say those are all vetoes? No. No, I don't think it's safe to say that. I think it's safe to say that we have to weigh the good versus the bad. And um, it's going to be it's going to be close. And we'll pour through them uh, like we do everything else and try and weigh that all out. So I wouldn't I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that they're all going to be vetoed, but they all have problems. What about ghost guns? How are you feeling? Uh, we haven't received that one yet, I don't believe. Um, it, you know, I don't have to get into that a little bit more. I don't think it's going to have um, the positive effects that, that many hope. I, I truly believe uh, every gun sold should be serialized. Um, but I'm also hearing from gun dealers, and I, and I have to prove this out, that they're not allowed by the feds to do that. And I just want to make sure that I understand that correctly. So we'll do our due diligence, go through that, and. Uh, see whether it goes or not. So you announced uh, summer EBT cards for families uh, who qualify. Uh, now, what I'm wondering is, does that include, as I guess regular EBTs do, uh, buying like, you know, candy, sugared soda, not just, you know, healthy stuff for kids, because it's the same to the kids, uh, but also junk food and and also, should there be, or is there, or should there be some sort of required nutrition training for people receiving these benefits? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm just thrilled that we were able to get through the bureaucratic nightmare uh, that the, the feds had created uh, and what was going to prevent us from taking advantage of this program to help families and kids in Vermont. Um, but they did give us a waiver, uh, a broad waiver, gave us some flexibility so that we would qualify. So. I, uh, I was breathing a sigh of relief uh, when that uh, notice came out yesterday because we weren't quite sure whether we'd be on the list or not. But we've been working feverishly. Our team at AHS and DCF in particular, um, Education, uh, Secretary uh, Saunders and others have been working feverishly to try and get to the point where they would accept uh, some of the conditions that we, we needed uh, to qualify. Um, to answer your question directly, I don't know, um, to be honest, on an EBT card, what is uh, what you qualify for, what what is included or not. Um, but I think it is a it's a federal issue, obviously, um, and I think there should be parameters on it from my standpoint. Uh, but that's uh, that's for the, the Congress to decide. Have you met with the pro tem or the speaker yet about the yield bill, property taxes? Where do we stand? Have not I reached out to the speaker. Uh, she wasn't available this week, and hopefully we're going to be able to meet next week. Last week you said, I believe, that there would be another proposal or another idea that you'd be bringing to the table. You said you weren't ready to talk about it. Yes. Any, any other? Yeah. Still, still not ready to talk about it. It's not something that we want to negotiate through the, the press. Um, first, we have to find out whether they have any interest in finding a different approach, a deal, uh, you know, compromise. Um, thus far, we haven't heard whether they are or aren't. Maybe they're counting votes to determine whether they will or they will not. Um, I'm hopeful that they will uh, come to the realization that we can do better, uh, that we can uh, we can actually have some structural reform. We can we can save uh, Vermonters money right now uh, while setting the path forward uh, for future education funding with some structural reform, reform that we uh, desperately need. So are you saying that you'll take the plan to them and we'll make it public? Yeah, no, I mean, we'll, we'll talk with them first. Again, I just want to be clear. Uh, they have to have an interest in, in doing so first. Um, but not, nothing it's nothing magical about this deal. Uh, we've we've testified on this with the uh, with the House and Senate. It's something they're familiar with. There's been some changes, some improvements, some other ideas that we could add in, um, but um, but it's going to be similar to what we've already testified on. But I think it's it's a bridge uh, to help Vermonters who can't afford a f almost 14 percent, or on average 14 percent increase in property taxes. So we're looking at this as a way 
to get to uh, where we can have this conversation about structural reform as well. So is it some kind of deferment? It's, I wouldn't call it a deferment, but there are uh, tapping into different pots of money so that we can uh, give the relief to, uh, to uh, these school districts now and Vermonters in general uh, from property taxes now. What pots of money? Oh, uh, we'll get to that soon. <laughs> All right, we'll move to the phones. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. He's not on. Not on. Back to the room. So uh, the convention on Saturday, you you told me that the you believe in a uh, secure, I think inviolate might have been the word you used, uh, border. And given that Vermont has the most porous border, the swamp sector, most porous in any part of the country. New Hampshire's gotten very aggressive on this, uh, but our Criminal Justice Council has been more hands-off on, on uh, immigrants. What can Vermont do about that? What can the state of Vermont do? And what do you think should be done? What's a, what's a good solution for this? Well, problem? again, I, I'm concerned about our southern border, uh, just like almost every other American. Uh, I think Congress needs to, to step up and act. I think the administration has to do something it's it, our problems if we have aren't anywhere near uh, what they're facing in uh, in the southern border uh, of our country. Um, so I think that they should um, they should uh, figure out a way uh, to to seal off the border uh, at least temporarily uh, so that they can um, they can properly identify who's coming in who who we should let in and uh, and just you know, solidify that uh, that border. Governor, also, it sounds like there's potentially dozens of layoffs at uh, Vermont Teddy Bear um, closing. Of, we're still gathering details, but like closing of at least one of the warehouses. What what do we know, and what what's your reaction to that? Well, thankfully, we have Secretary Curley right here who can probably answer that. I I did hear that. Uh, uh, in the last couple of days, and um, it's, which is unfortunate, but uh, maybe she can answer. That. I can try. <laughs> I can try, Calvin. Um, yes, uh, as I reported a while back, that the Vermont Teddy Bear sold. Um, there were four companies or, or assets to four companies within the sale. It was Vermont Teddy Bear, Pajama Gram, Pajama Gre uh, Jeans, and the, and the one for you. And two companies um, collectively bought those four. And the one company that bought the assets of Vermont Teddy Bear, the manufacturing of the bear as we know it, um, bought the assets and, employ, uh, and the employees uh, went to work for them. As I understand it, they are all set. They're going to continue here in Vermont. The other company that bought the other three couldn't come to an agreement with the, um, with the owner of the, um, of the, the building. Uh, that, that the operations are run out of. So they are moving their operations out of state. As a result, there are uh, just under 30 employees that are impacted by this. And the, Depart the Vermont Department of Labor is working with them. And if you want more detail, uh, Michael Harrington, Commissioner Michael Harrington, is going to be your best bet. Do we know where they're moving the jobs to? Um, as I understand it, it's Kentucky, but um, you you might want to go right to the source there. That's what's been let out to me. Commissioner Harrington, is there anything else you want to add to that? Uh, thank you, Governor. I think the only thing I would add is, um, as is typical, when there is a layoff at a company, we'll work with both the company and the affected employees to ensure they receive what are called rapid response services, uh, which include both reemployment services, but also information about unemployment insurance benefits. Um, so we have been in contact uh, with uh, the affected employees to the best of our ability based on the information we have, uh, and also uh, have been talking with the company to better understand the circumstances around the layoff and what are the terms of the separation, which just helps us navigate um, both the, the reemployment and unemployment um, uh, process but also helps us understand whether or not there are any implications as it relates to the Federal Warren Act or Vermont's Notice of Potential Layoff Act. 
Commissioner, were, did they file a, a Warren Act uh, notice or fill out that, that paperwork in time? They did provide us with a notice, um, which was roughly around the same time they were notifying their employees of the layoff. Uh, they did provide us a list of who the affected employees are. Um, I think the, the one area for us that we also are trying to understand better is um, the notice period. Uh, so as many know, under both the Federal Warrant Act and Vermont's uh, Layoff Act, uh, there is a 45-day notice period, um, but there are certain um, exceptions or exemptions to that based on the circumstances. We also don't under uh, fully understand uh, what type of benefits or, or separation packages uh, were included uh, for those roughly 30 people. So the more we know and the more information we can get, the better we can understand um, whether there are other implications as well. Thanks. Um, Governor, the best read story in the Chronicle this week is about an 80-year-old Burlington man who was knocked down and beaten unconscious in a random broad daylight attack. Uh, the suspect was cited and released by the court. Uh, do you or uh, uh, Public Safety Commissioner Morrison uh, have anything to tell Vermonters uh, who are concerned about what amounts to catch and release of suspects of violent acts? Yeah, um, from my standpoint again, and maybe Commissioner Morrison can add to this, but uh, but I read that uh, as well, and I, I just find it unacceptable to, uh, to release someone who has uh, committed such an egregious act on just an unsuspecting 82-year-old. And I think it just speaks volumes of, about why we put forward many initiatives uh, with the legislature. And, and again, we got uh, a long ways with that with the legislature, the Senate in particular. Um, but um, we didn't get everything we wanted. But um, these are the site types of things uh, that keep me awake at night. Mr. Morrison. Uh, yes, sir, Governor. I agree with what you said in that this is ex this is exactly the type of scenario that we have seen in the last few years that caused us to bring the proposals to the table that we did and to work so hard to try and put more tools in the toolbox of the judiciary and of law enforcement to protect the public from perpetrators. And I agree, um, I, I, I'm, you called this particular incident out, and um, I also took particular note of it because it is incredibly savage to think that an elderly, vulnerable person walking alone, minding their business on the sidewalk, for all intents and purposes, gets sucker punched, which of course, causing a fall from standing height and hitting your head without any breaking of the you know, of your fall because you've been knocked unconscious is a very serious act. And we send the wrong message to our public when we continue to release people who consistently come back into the community and uh, commit more crimes. So I think this case is uh, going to be a prime example of why we need to continue the fight to put more tools in the hands of judges and of law enforcement to actually protect the public uh, and enhance public safety uh, while still balancing the rights of individuals. So thank you for raising this incident. I think it's an important one. What tools were, were brought forth in the session this year that would help with that? You're putting me on the spot. We're my, one of my other policy member teams uh, uh, tracked this bill, but we uh, have talked about removing, we have succeeded in removing in S-58 the uh, $200 bail in certain circumstances, uh, the ability for judges to consider prior violations of conditions of release uh, and failures to appear as criteria for whether or not to set bail at all, and various other, um, I would say, incremental steps, progress towards uh, trying to have a credible response to what has been referred to as the catch and release of uh, familiar faces in communities. Again, yes. again, what makes this so egregious is the background of this individual, the perpetrator, uh, who is known uh, to law enforcement. And I think the, um, I think the chief uh, got it right as well, uh, his outrage uh, 
in, in dealing with this situation. Is, uh, that's why we need change. We need, we need more help. I don't think they're on your debt or in your office, yes, but the slate of criminal justice bills, how are you planning on acting on that? Again, we'll take a look at each one. I think in general, uh, as I said, I think they came a long ways and, and uh, moved in the right direction. So I'm hoping uh, that there's uh, not technical issues with the bills uh, that would uh, force us to, to veto them. I, I would rather move forward and take what we can get now and keep working on this in the in the future. Okay, so barring technical errors signing? I, yeah, I mean, it, I don't know if there were others that I'm not aware of, but the ones we worked on mm -hmm. uh, with the legislature, uh, I would like to sign. So that's 58, like the omnibus bill. There's retail theft, 534, conditions of release, 195, and then 655 record ceiling. Yeah, the, the record ceiling was one that uh, is unfortunate. It's just a study. Um, I, we wanted more. We, we wanted the records to be sealed up um, and not expunged, but now there's just a study. So we didn't get very far on that one. Okay. So That's, will you not sign that well, one? Well, no, I'm, I'm not saying I, we'll take a look at it. I'm not saying we will or we won't. We want to make sure that we get there at some point. Mr. Morris, Mr. Morrison. I was just going to say, Governor, that the retail theft bill is not one that, that had been part of our package of proposals, uh, S-58, and as you properly recognize, 195 were, and were uh, happy with the outcome generally, barring technical um, problems with either of those. And as it relates, as the Governor said, to the ceiling bill, um, <laughs> this is a little bit of a bad lunch that keeps repeating on us, right? We really need to get to a scheme that can remain in place for a long time. Uh, and I'll, I'll just speak a little bit to what uh, Secretary Moore said. The idea of sealing records versus expunging records is a philosophical question, but the operationalizing of actually doing these things inside a records management system and inside multiple databases that all have to be able to show the same thing when a person's name and date of birth is queried is very difficult. So the operationalizing of philosophical constructs has to be taken into consideration when we are forming public policy about important topics like this. Secretary Moore said in her remarks that a lot of the bills that went through the legislature this year didn't take into consideration the capacity of ANR to implement these things. You've also gotten a lot of criticism from the legislature about understaffing and, or they would say understaffing, and vacancies in state government. So I, I, the question isn't like, which is it? But is it like a chicken or the egg sort of thing? How do you respond to those criticisms? Well, it's probably a little bit of both, but we want to fill those positions. We actively are pursuing um, people to fill those positions, just like, Every single entity throughout Vermont, every single sector is, uh, is challenged by this workforce dilemma, which leads us back to what do they need? How do we get more people here into Vermont? They need housing, decent affordable housing, and that's why housing was so important to us. And the only reason that I'm looking at that bill that passed to see if, if it if it, the good outweighs the bad, you know? It's going to be that type of thing because we desperately need housing in order to help our economy and help our workforce and so forth. Um, but, but there's so many negatives to it that we're gonna have to weigh that out. And see, you know, prime example of does the good outweigh the bad? Um, but we also have to make Vermont more affordable. I mean, we hear time and time again uh, from Vermonters about, I can't afford to stay here. I, I can't afford to live here anymore lived here all my life. I don't think I can stay here. And that's heartbreaking when you think about that because, again, they've invested their lives, lives here, uh, their families here, but with the increase in property taxes and, and all the other taxes that are being imposed and just the cost of living in general, it just uh, precludes them from staying. So, again, we need to keep working on that. So you don't 
want the vacancy rate to be what it, you want those jobs filled? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we want to fill all the positions that are uh, open. Uh, we have uh, Vermont State Police as well. I mean, we have in every single agency and department, we have vacancies that we want to fill. And we'll continue to advocate and try and find people to fill them. We don't even have the applicants, which is, again, what every single business throughout Vermont is facing as well. Yeah. No, no, I was going to change the subject for what it's worth. Um, <laughs> we talked a couple weeks ago back in the ceremonial office about the, the tension in the building this legislative session and the relationship with the legislature. And now that you've announced that you're running again, assuming you win, how do you see yourself going forward with the next legislature? Well, again, what I said in my remarks was true. I don't want to veto bills. I want to find a path forward where everyone can live with whatever they're trying to move forward with. Because many times, it's a, it's a common goal. So it's just how we get there. And we have to have these conversations. They have to be willing to listen to us and listen to the experts, the secretaries of the agencies and all of their people there to understand the pitfalls and what they're presenting. And if they continue to ignore those suggestions, then we get to the tension part. So they have to listen. They have to prioritize. They're going to have to pick and choose, I think, I believe, a little bit more. They can't do everything. Not all one year, not all one week. I mean, they certainly tried in the last week. I mean. 100 bills in the whole session since January. About 65 of them passed in the last three days. 30-something passed in the last day. I mean, that's incredible. And that's just not good government. It doesn't even give the legislators time to read the bills and understand what they're voting for. So we'll see what happens, but I'm just asking, as I said before, I'm not asking you to cross the aisle. I'm asking you to meet me in the middle. Let's have a conversation. Back to kind of what Stephen was asking earlier about politics. Um, it appears as though you will not be facing off or challenge, uh, debating uh, former Governor Dean. What, what did you make of the news when, when he announced? Um, again, it didn't have any impact on my decision to run. I have a tremendous, tremendous amount of respect for Governor Dean. Uh, he was in the, he was governor when I came into to office in the Senate, um, so had an opportunity to meet and speak with him. So, I um, and I've had good conversations with him since. So, I um, again, it didn't have any effect on my decision, but uh, but I appreciate his perspective, and I appreciate, and he still continues to give his perspective at times uh, when we're debating certain issues, and he'll reach out. So. I look forward to continue to do that in the future, a if elected, oh, sorry. if I'm elected. A lot of this press conference, too, near the end, talked about insurance companies, health care. Certainly that's part of his bailiwick. But I know you recently signed the prior authorization bill. Um, what was your thought process behind that and, and what, what it will actually accomplish? Well, I think the, the providers made a compelling case. Uh, they uh, they talked about you know the prior authorizations, how much time it takes, and the amount of bureaucracy, red tape within the system, to get to the answer that they had asked about maybe the month before, and it all eventually comes around so that it's, it's authorized, but they have to go through the the, the mill so to speak uh, to get there. And uh, it seems to me um, they made some sense with that, and uh, but uh, as well, I was uh, certainly. Uh, I'm always concerned about costs, and the insurance company said it could, could increase costs. And the providers were saying it could, could reduce costs. Um, so I thought um, we, should, we should try this and uh, make sure that we put uh, the right people on it, our Department of Financial Regulation, uh, to oversee this. 
uh, to collect the data to see what's real and what's not, and asking the Green Mountain Care Board to do the same and prove it out. If, um, if, if, if the insurance companies are wrong, they need, providers need to prove that. Uh, and if they're right, we need to change it. So, so we're collecting the data, uh, providing some oversight, and um, we'll see where we go with this. But, uh, but I thought it was worth the risk to provide for more help uh, to the providers, those on the ground. And, and there, is there like a sunset to this bill or like an escape no. valve, like if we find that this is actually driving up rates? Yeah, there's no uh, sunset to this bill that I'm aware of. But as you know, every legislative session is new and you can reverse course if you see that there's a problem. And we've, we've done that. I mean, look at bail reform. We, I signed that bill, um, but it wasn't the right thing to do uh, in, in the uh, aftermath. And so we reverse course, and the legislature is going along with us on that. Uh, Governor, you recently uh, named an appointee to fill Dick Moss's vacant seat. Um, how did you come to the decision on who to appoint for that? Um, yeah, the, um, there were six candidates that were submitted by the Democratic parties of Grand Isle and, and uh, Colchester. And uh, Andy uh, was someone who has an economic development background. Um, he uh, served on a school board, uh, grew up in South Hero, uh, knows the area, <clears throat> and spoke very highly of Senator Mazza. Um, so I thought um, he seems like, a, again, someone who is approachable, listens, and uh, tries to help uh, their constituents in his roles today uh, in the, the Grand Isle Economic Development Council, as well as um, when he was a school board member. So I thought he had all the attributes uh, needed uh, to perform this job, at least over the next uh, few months. Thank you all.